welcome to the University of Maastricht program on the reform of international investment law. I am Nicolas de Sadler. In the first interview, we discuss the place occupied by this legal field within the international legal order. Today, we shall address the tensions arising from the reform of this legal field, be it political or economic tensions. It's my pleasure to invite my guest today, Ivan Adamianovic, who is a specialist of this field and who has been publishing a book on the European Union and the ongoing reform. In 2011, a team of experts issued a report on the impact of uh, the forthcoming uh, CETA treaty uh, concluded between uh, Canada and the European Union and tw the 27 member states. And these experts uh, reach a conclusion that the investment chapter of the forthcoming treaties was likely to produce no benefits to the uh, parties. Is there any evidence to demonstrate the correlation between the conclusion of a mega treaty such as CETA and the promotion of foreign direct investment? Indeed, there is no conclusive evidence which would demonstrate the direct link between having a bilateral investment treaty and increase uh, in capital flows. Nevertheless, we have to look at this from a broader perspective. So investment protection complements investment liberalization, which is part of trade agreements, which you mentioned trade agreements such as CETA. Do you believe that uh, the traditional bilateral investment treaties conclude, for instance, between uh, Congo and Belgium uh, will be replaced by uh, these new generations of mega treaty combining trade and investment? Well, you mentioned CETA and that is an example of a new trend where investment protection becomes a chapter within a much bigger trade agreement. So there is a trend towards um, replacing bilateral investment treaties with mega trade treaties, um, but there is also a trend of updating old bilateral investment treaties with a new generation of bilateral investment treaties. <laughs> So far we discussed CETA, which is not the only trade and investment treaty the EU has been negotiating with third states. In addition, the member states, the 27 member states, have been concluding more than 1,400 bilateral treaties with third states. Are the Europeans playing a key role in shaping the development of investment law? Uh, is the EU at the helm? Well, I would say that the EU is a newcomer to the field of international investment law, but you're correct, member states have played a key role in the development of international investment law. It all started with German BIT program and other yeah, member states earlier, and other member states yeah. followed. But there is also uh, uh, the US bilateral investment uh, treaty, which then influenced the development of the North American uh, investment agreement. And NAFTA would be the core example of such an agreement. <music> To sum up, there are two different approaches. On the one hand, the uh, European approach that has been shaped by the German uh, by IT model, and on the other hand, the North American approach that has been shaped by the uh, USA uh, by IT model. What are the striking differences between these two approaches? Well, the European model exclusively focuses on the protection of investment in the post-establishment stage. So once the investment has already been made. The American model, in addition to post-establishment protection, offers also pre-establishment protection. So in, in that sense, we could say that it, it is more 
likely to promote investment liberalization. These two models uh, do provide uh, for specific rights, uh, be it the FAT clause or the indemnification for expropriations. Are these rights framed in a similar way? Well, there are similarities in terms of the protection, but these rights are differently formulated, if you like. So the older type of European BIT model based on the German BIT provides broad, vague provisions. The North American model is more detailed. There are also differences in, for example, fair and equitable treatment. So in the American model, it is explicitly stated that fair and equitable treatment equals the minimum standard of treatment under customary international law. But the American model, and in particular the case law stemming from NAFTA, has influenced the standards in new European Union treaties. Uh, Cross-fertilization, so to speak. Yes. What struck me the most is the importance played by China, the second world economy, in trading. Um, China is not only a capital import country, attracting investors, investment from the USA or from Europe, but it's also a capital export country, in particular with respect to this Belt and Road Initiative. What's your views on the matter? Well, China has not played a very significant role in international investment law, unlike in trade law. But it, nevertheless, it has embraced arbitration as a dispute settlement model and it has been developing its own arbitral institutions. If I understand correctly, uh, one is facing different arbitration forum. You have been mentioning exit, now you do mention uh, the Chinese uh, arbitration schemes. Are we facing a multipolar legal world? Well, arbitration forums have always had their own rules. So the, the point is that all these players are embracing the same model, which is arbitration. We could say that in terms of Chinese arbitral institutions, they're also more embracing Chinese characteristics of dispute settlement, which also involves mediation. A multipolar legal world, so to speak. We could talk about a multipolar wor world and we see that in the reform process these different players do have different ideas about how the reform should look like. So far we discussed the approach endorsed by major economies, be the EU or the USA. What are the positions held by the Global South countries? Of course, the Global South countries have been on the receiving end of ISDS claims, and that explains why they are more skeptical towards the system. As a consequence, some big countries of the Global South, like India, South Africa, Indonesia, have been either terminating their BITs, or they have created a new model BIT, which has much more restrictive rights for foreign investors. Another example is Brazil that has never actually concluded any BITs. So there are different approaches in the global south. Indeed, a very complex legal world. It seems to me that uh, Western nations hosting foreign direct investment are also subject to litigation. Is this correct? Yes, indeed. So developed states have not been spared either from investment claims more recently. And usually these claims are a reaction to measures that these states make in the public interest. For example, a health measure or in particular climate change measures. So of course that has all led to skepticism towards ISDS in the West. So it explains the reactions among the Belgian population here against uh, CETA treaty a few years ago? Yes, that is certainly the case and as a consequence what we are seeing is the approach of the EU towards the reform of ISDS, so changing the arbitration model with the new model, but we are also seeing that in some North-North relations we don't have ISDS anymore. So for example in the new NAFTA there is no ISDS between the US and Canada or the EU is currently negotiating a free trade agreement with Australia 
and there is no ISDS in that agreement. Even more complex than I ever thought. Thank you very much indeed, Ivan Adamianovich. We will have further opportunities to delve into these issues quite soon. Goodbye. My pleasure. Thank you.